Good morning, everyone. I'd like to reiterate first what Glido said. I'd like to thank all of you for being here, both the speakers, the participants, the sponsors. We are a university. There are a lot of students here. It is impossible to put on this conference without our event partners and our sponsors. And uh, beyond your publicity and being part of this community, I want to thank you. You're helping create the next generation of blockchain entrepreneurs, employees, and partners. So without you, we could not do this. And so I'd like to thank you for your support. I'd like to thank also many of our speakers who have come from very far away. We have over 100 speakers this year. Uh, some of them have taken long trips to come here. I think it is by far the deepest, best group of speakers we've had at Decentralized, deepest, best group of participants. And I know it might be easy to say, well, I'm going to go to London or New York or San Francisco, and those are important conferences. But what we've seen going to various conferences is there are different communities, and there are different communities around the world. And so coming here and sharing your insights with this community of the, let's call it, Mediterranean region is very, very important. I'd like to cover two topics, a very quick recap of what we've been doing at the University of Nicosia, and then, as I do every year, some general thoughts about where we are in general in the industry and what we need to focus on. At the university, as with last year, this is a very gratifying moment. This initiative started in 2013, and there were two of us. And then in 2014, there were four of us. The community now is somewhere in the range of 40,000 people who have attended a course, attended a degree program, attended a conference, started a decentralized chapter, are working with us as research partners. And it's an extremely gratifying feeling. In 2013, we concluded that blockchain would be a fundamental building block of the fourth industrial revolution, that it was very important, that in order for it to actually be implemented, we had to educate a lot of people, that other universities would have to educate a lot of people. And seeing that going from a theory to a reality is immensely gratifying for us. The team is growing. I mentioned this before, I think it's still true, we have the largest number of people at any university in the world working on blockchain topics, either from an academic perspective, a teaching perspective, a research perspective, an administrative perspective, including, of course, everyone that helped put this conference together. So this is our favorite two days of the year. It is the chance for us to see all our students faculty, friends, colleagues, partners, in person. And so thank you all for coming, and I hope that you have a wonderful two days. Now, <clears throat> let's switch gears a little bit and talk about where I think we are industry-wise. In 2017, when I opened, I said, blockchain's important not because the price of Bitcoin is going to go up or down, but because you're going to take all of your political legal usage rights that today are intermediated by a centralized third-party health database, and they will be brought into an open shared database. It is an expansion of human freedom. Let's hold that thought. Last year, I was a little bit darker. I said, AI is another very important building block of the fourth industrial revolution. It is proceeding rapidly. And it is a centralizing force. It is a force that has economies of scale. It has economies of scale in data. It has economies of scale in computation. It is going to be probably the most powerful technology in humanity's history. And it is going to consolidate in the hands of centralized parties. Those parties might be Google, they might be a national government, they might be some startup we haven't heard of, but it generally centralizes. And blockchains, which are decentralized, 
are potentially a counterweight, a way to balance out the centralization of data and distribute the benefits of AI and machine learning more broadly. So how are we doing? So it's now two years. We said the first hypothesis that blockchain was important, we said it in 2013, turns out that was right. How are the other things doing? And what I'd like to talk about today is I think we're not doing as well as we should be doing. We're not moving as quickly as we should be moving. And we are looking at the risks in the wrong way. And let me get to specifics. 2017, I calculated data about Antonis Polamidis, writes about Antonis Polamidis. Can he stay in this hotel room? Does he have an undergraduate degree issued by this institution? Can he vote in the municipal elections of Nicosia or New York? Are stored in thousands and thousands of databases. I don't know what the number is, but it's in the thousands. Two years later, are any of those in the two jurisdictions I know best, Nicosia and New York, now in a, on a blockchain? And the answer, as far as I can tell, is no. None. Great theory, great idea, makes perfect sense. Implementation, zero. Now that's interesting. Uh, in 2018, we said one way you can fight the centralization if you're particularly a government uh, state entity, you have access to public data of the big machine learning AI giants is to make data available. And it's easier for public entities, right, because it's public data. Make data available on an equal basis, both to Google, but also a startup and a citizen. Make their data transparent, make their data open. And blockchains allow you to open it, but not open it. It's not, you're just, it allows you to preserve privacy while opening it. Am I aware of any data, public data, that has been made public on a blockchain in the last year? And I believe the answer is also no. So <clears throat> why is this, right? Like, it's a very good idea. And we are still having the similar discussions we were having four or five years ago. Here's a bunch of things that can happen in theory, and they're not. And in the meantime, we're trading bitcoins and Ethereum and some of the financial infrastructure around that is being built. You know, there's qualified custodians now in the United States, and there weren't two years ago. And interestingly, we are seeing, to my surprise, the first country that is going to issue a central bank digital currency is not some small island nation somewhere in the world who's nimble and active. It's going to be the People's Republic of China, which is impressive. It's the second largest country in the world, and it is going to have out-innovated on this topic small nations who depend on being ahead on this topic. So that's interesting. But why, why isn't it moving faster? And I think one of the fundamental differences, it's subtle, but it's very important. When the internet started in the early 90s to be commercialized, primarily in the United States, the United States has very strong free speech protections. And there was an article I remember in the New York Times, an editorial, Okay, we understand that the internet's important, and we understand that it's a useful distribution mechanism, but who is going to be the editor of things written on the internet? Right? Because the New York Times was used to being a gatekeeper. You couldn't publish if you didn't go through an editor, and so logically, okay, it's fine. We will let the people use computers, but someone important, serious, well, that knows things better will decide what is acceptable to say or do. And because it's speech in the United States and you can't actually restrict it uh, except in very limited circumstances, the gatekeepers weren't in fact able to act as gatekeepers either on a private or national level. And you had the explosion of new interesting ideas that also disrupted the gatekeepers. What has happened I think here with blockchains and particularly public blockchains, they have gone, not incorrectly, I would say, but they have gone under the rubric of financial instruments. And financial instruments have no particular uh, right to be freely uh, managed in most countries. 
And instead, what happens is we are now moving at the pace of banking regulation, which banking regulation, I'm not saying it's not important, and it exists and it serves its role, but the one thing that I would say about banking regulation is not that it evolves quickly, not that it evolves at the pace of um, technology. And I want to be clear, I'm not opposed to these types of regulations. They are important. But the risks from what I see in discussions with policymakers are being misallocated. The number of times in the last year I have heard the fifth AML directive is like every other day. And the AML is important, and it is something we should keep in mind. But it is important the way brushing your teeth is important, and like having speed limits for cars is important. It's a, it needs to be a part of the package, but it is not, it is not what you're trying to do, right? What I hear, I will say this with all love for the European Union, I hear this even more in the European Union than the United States. It seems like the major components of the strategy is how do we prevent money laundering? Important, an important topic, but that's not a strategy. Right? If we're going to go build a car, you have to actually build a car and then worry about having speed limits on the highways. Right? Like we can't, the whole discussion about building a car can't be what's the speed limit going to be and how fast can we go on this highway. And that's great, but we don't have any cars right now. There's no cars on the highway, so the speed limits are irrelevant. The other thing that has happened is because of this heavy regulatory load, the other organizations being involved have large organizations. So there's a lot of, there have been a lot of blockchain trials by big companies. Some of them genuine, some of them because the board of directors called the CEO and said, I've heard this blockchain thing is very important, why aren't you doing it? And the CEO, of course, says, well, of course I'm doing a blockchain trial, didn't I tell you? And so there's a lot of that. And the, I've read about or participated in a lot of them, and the corporate blockchain trials are all of the bucket, everyone wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. We are going to have all the wonders of this decentralized, open, machine-readable technology, but fortunately, it is going to stay under our company's control. Almost all of them follow this format. We are going to have our own private blockchain, and fortunately, everyone on planet Earth wants to come on ours, right? And I believe that's not how it's going to play out. I believe that's not how you will end up getting mass adoption. You have to let go a little bit. You have to take some risk. So what I'm saying here is I believe the governments and the state entities need to take a little bit more risk, but the corporations need to take a little bit more risk because for better or for worse, when we've gone to a world that you need a significant legal force to do things legally, it ends up in the buckets of big corporations. And then in the buckets of corporations, they tend to be slower, et cetera, et cetera. Now, okay, but why? What's the problem? Why? I said risk was misallocated. Uh, people are looking at the wrong risks. And I've, what do I mean by that? I mean the following. We have all types of risks that are happening every single day that we get used to and ignore. One million people a year die in car accidents. There is a 747 falling out of the sky every single day. Every day. It doesn't phase anyone, really. I mean, everyone believes in road safety and public safety, but we're not acting as if a 747 is falling out of the sky every day. The third largest cause of death in the United States is medical error. Heart disease, cancer, medical error. Supply, food supply chains, even in developed countries, are effectively corrupted. There was a study done last year where they went to about 20 sushi and seafood restaurants in the United States. You hear, oh, it's in some developing country. No, in the United States. And they took the fish and they said, oh, this is a salmon, a tuna, or what have you. And they did genetic testing to see what it was. 44% of the fish on the menu was not the fish that the menu said it was. And then the funny part is that they're not even sure if it was the restaurant that was cheating 
the supplier that was cheating, the wholesaler to the supplier that was cheating. But the effective outcome was, even in the United States, we do not have a supply chain that can take a tuna and land it in a restaurant, and at the end, it's still a tuna, right? It might be something else. So the existing risks we normalize, we forget about. We say those are okay, and we focus on the new and the new and exciting risks. And what that means is we're spending an awful lot of time on things that might theoretically happen, while ignoring things that theoretically we can fix in the fourth industrial revolution, we will fix car accidents. Not tomorrow, not in a year, but somewhere in five to ten years, we will effectively solve car accidents. And if we solve car accidents a year earlier, we will save one million lives. If I mention to someone that there was, I don't know, a child stuck in a cave, and if we did not rescue them, they would die. Hundreds of people would mobilize, helicopters, Navy SEALs, etc., to rescue them, to save the life. But when it's a million lives, we don't have the same sense of urgency. But that's not actually even what I'm worried about. <clears throat> certain countries, certain entities are progressing in these technologies. And usually, usually when you talk about the fourth industrial revolution, and usually when I talk about it, I say happy things. We'll have our self-driving cars, they will communicate with blockchains, you're in a hurry to go to a meeting, your car will automatically negotiate with your grandmother's car to get out of the way, you'll get to your meeting faster, your grandmother will stack some Satoshis, it's very exciting, like everyone wins, this is the happy future of tomorrow. But that, there are also other potential outcomes that are more dystopian. If you don't manage to actually distribute, if you don't manage to actually decentralize, what all these technologies will do is increase inequality. They will increase inequality on an individual basis. They will increase inequality across nations. And we're seeing that now. The world is somehow more fragile than it was 10 years ago. You are seeing the stressors come out of the system. And these stressors are bringing out policy responses that are policy responses of the previous generation, and none of them are going to work. Nationalism, redistribution, the old stories of the left and the right, they're yelling at each other. None of those are going to solve the problem, right? Because the problem is not that. The problem is we have networked capabilities, we have networked economies. If you do not manage the networks correctly, you have runaway winners in the networks, and nothing you can do regulatorily is going to fix that. You have to find a way to set the technical infrastructure to distribute the gains from technology and to distribute them organically. So my general message and hope and plea is that we get more ambitious, that we move faster, that we feel more of a sense of urgency. All of this, the only underlying point of doing these things is to improve human well-being. The technologies that are coming over the next decade have the opportunity to transform human well-being, to close the gap between rich and poor, to close the gap between developed and developing nations. And if we don't handle it correctly, they will do the exact opposite. Now, I'll finish with this because it's easy to criticize others and easy to let yourself off the hook. I have the great honor of running a lot of the operations of a large organization. We have 2,100 employees, faculty and staff. We have 12,500 students at the university and then in some partnerships we have in Africa with other universities, another 18,000. So we're the type of big company that I was complaining about. So what have we done? Well, in 2013, we accepted Bitcoin for tuition. That's very good. 
in 2014, we published certificates on the blockchain. That's very good. And now that's a company, and Alexis Nigolau is running it, and it's very good. And after 2014, the number of implementations of blockchains at the University of Nicosia is zero. We did the two standard usage cases that people have been talking about since 2011. Sure, can you make a financial payment with it? Yes. Can you make an attestation with it? Yes, and by the, there we're still pretty actually ahead, and a lot of other people should be making attestations, and they're not. Have we used it to somehow change the way we operate? Have we used it to go, there's an old saying about economists that even in a market economy, there are capitalists across companies and communists within companies. We're the same way. We have 2,100 faculty and staff, and we run our internal economy on a top-down, you know, Soviet Union style thing, right? You know, the board of directors makes a decision and somehow it flows through the layers and you hope the five-year plan works out, but that's not really the right way to do it, right? It should be coming up from the bottom. You should organize people with markets and pricing and have give people skin in the game and blockchains theoretically can do that and we're doing none of it. So, I don't want to just give other people homework assignments. That was a university. We're good at giving people homework assignments. I'm going to give myself a homework assignment. Next year, we will have a third usage case. I don't know what it is, because I decided this morning that we're going to have a third usage case. So, team here at the University of Nicosia, I would ask kindly that you do not embarrass me in 2020 when I come up on the stage and say, we thought really hard about all the different uses of blockchain, and it turns out there are none. We're canceling Decentralized 2020. Blockchains turn out not to be a big deal at all. There's nothing to do here, right? So obviously that's not true. So obviously we need to get going. Obviously we need to push faster. Obviously we need to have faster cycle times. Obviously we need to push our organizations, our community, our countries towards this brighter future that technology can bring. So I hope to we go on this journey with you. We uh, like nothing more than working with all of you in any form, shape, capacity to move society forward, to move humanity forward. And I thank you very, very much for joining us.